Uh, how are you, Abid? Do you hear me well? السلام عليكم الجميع يسمعوني اوكي انا اوف ميوت Testing. Yes, yeah, I hear you very well. Yeah, just we are waiting. Uh, everyone is logging in. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أه حيا لكم الله جميعا أه معكم ريما زامل أه في هذه الورشة حتكون مع الأستاذ عابد قرشي واسمحوا لي أتكلم بالإنجليش الورشة حتقدم بالإنجليش أه السلام عليكم بريوان أه today it is our pleasure uh, to welcome you at the first session of our uh, digital projects webinar uh, our last session with engineer Abed Qurashi. Uh, he, will, he will talk today uh, with us about Scrum for managing unpredictable projects. Uh, the good things for the last session with Mr. Salah, some people have been asking about Agile and how it's affecting uh, when is the best time to be used. So I think now uh, engineer Abed will uh, elaborate more about um, Scrum in particular. Uh, please allow me to uh, give a little brief about Engineer Abid. Uh, he's a Scrum Alliance certified um, enterprise coach and a certified Scrum uh, trainer, and he has successful experience in providing different uh, uh, Scrum courses and software development. Uh, before we start, uh, please uh, let us all agree on some of the rules. Uh, we will have to uh, mute all the participants for to assure the quality of the presentation. If you have any um, concerns or questions, you can share it with uh, Engineer Abed at the chat. We will make sure all your questions uh, answered during this session. For any unanswered questions, also it is our pleasure uh, to uh, share uh, your questions and answer it by sharing your questions on our um, on our accounts, our uh, Twitter account or our uh, uh, email. I will share it with you at the chat box. Uh, now, allow me, uh, it is, uh, you can start, Engineer Abid. Okay, assalamu alaikum. Um, so thank you very much, uh, um, Reem, for the introduction. Uh, thank you very much for introducing me as engineer. <laughs> it's a very flattering term. Uh, it's something that uh, I'm uh, identify with most, actually. Uh, yes, I do some training and I do some coaching, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, I'm actually happiest uh, coding. Actually, I'm a software software developer, and uh, uh, so so um, I have studied uh, some aspects of uh, project management. Uh, I'll begin with my my journey, really. Um, so uh, I'm a software developer, and um, I I. I uh, um, when I moved to the UK, I was working for a startup, and in the startup, we were I was doing um, pretty much everything you do in a startup, which means you're doing marketing, you're doing uh, 
<coughs> I was doing back end development, I was doing front end coding, I was testing, I was sitting with customers and users and gathering requirements, I was doing everything. And as we grew, uh, we hired, decided to hire a project manager, and it was a Prince2 uh, project manager. So um, uh, this was something I was new to. So I was born in Canada and growing up in Canada, uh, in the professional world, we have PMP, uh, you know, influenced by the, by the United States. Um, but in the UK, it was, uh, Prince2 was something completely new to me. So um, I noticed that uh, all of a sudden, uh, things started to come to a grinding halt. Uh, things were not getting done. Before, when there was something wrong with the project, uh, there needed some testing to do or some gathering, some requirements gathering uh, or coding, uh, everybody moved to where the, where the gap was. So if, there, if there's a lot of requirements to gather, um, everyone, uh, regardless of their expertise, went to gather requirements. If we had lots of requirements and we didn't have any, and we, didn't have, we, we had lots of testing to do, everybody was doing testing. So we were doing this um, uh, continuously. And then as we grew, um, our project manager said, okay, Abid, you are now a backend resource, which means you're only allowed to touch the backend code and you have to report to the head of backend. And I said, but I can do front-end development. And they said, nope, you're now a back-end resource. So then they uh, hired a back-end uh, team lead, front-end team lead, a testing team lead, and a business analyst team lead. And as a result, nothing was getting done because everybody was saying, that's not my job. Or sometimes there was a lot of testing work to do and uh, there wasn't enough testers. And the developers were waiting for the testers to finish their testing so they can face the defects. Um, the developers and the testers were waiting for the business analyst to complete their work and everything was centrally controlled by this new Prince2 project manager and I said to him, I said, why are we doing things this way? And he said, oh, but we're going to be a big company and so we have to do things in a more mature way, in a more controlled manner, we're using Prince2. So I didn't know what this was, so I went and I studied it. I figured, well, maybe, maybe there's something to this. Um, really, I did it because I couldn't figure out why we would use such an approach. It was really uh, getting in the way. Everything had to go through our project manager and our team leads. We couldn't just do things like we used to. So uh, I went and I studied Prince2. And uh, it's, if you look at my profile, you can see here that I'm a former Prince2 practitioner. It's actually not true. I have never practiced Prince2 in my life. Okay. Uh, what happened was I passed the foundation exam in the morning. And then I wrote the practitioner exam in the afternoon. So really, I didn't have any time to practice Prince 2. Um, Prince 2, as you know, is a, about a, there used to be a 450 page manual. I have the manual here now, it's now 400 pages. Um, and uh, I couldn't figure out how to apply it. Uh, it was very, very large. So um, uh, I have never been able to practice Prince 2. However, they still allow to call, I'm still allowed to call myself a practitioner, even though I've never practiced it, which is a bit of a, a problem. Um, uh, it's, I find it strange that, they, they, that uh, you, can pr you can call yourself a practitioner in something that you've never practiced. But um, uh, so I'm, I'm actually a software developer. I, I write code. I'm happiest when I'm writing code. A lot of these credentials that I have really are just so that I can connect with people for, and see other people's uh, perspectives. Uh, but really, I'm uh, most proud of being able to actually do the work as opposed to managing people to do the work, but actually do the work uh, myself. Um, one of the things I realized early on in my journey was um, when, I, when I was looking at Prince2 and, and looking at um, other uh, uh, frameworks um, that, well, um, that I realized uh, there are a couple of, of things that uh, led to uh, poor product or uh, project uh, performance. And one is uh, big projects. Uh, big projects tend to fail catastrophically and epically. Um, if you look in, in the UK, of course, uh, my experience is really limited to the UK. Most of my work has been in the UK uh, for projects. And uh, we use Prince2, which is basically all of the government's um, processes, uh, which they deem as best practices. Uh, all of their processes uh, put into one framework. And uh, now these are the same processes that are being used on the largest projects in the UK. Uh, the ones uh, that are run, um, uh, the, the people who are running these projects are people who wrote the Prince2 manual, okay? And these projects, well, let's see here. We've got one project which is 30 billion pounds overrun, uh, three years behind schedule, so that's the high-speed rail system. We have Crossrail, 
uh, which is also a government-run project, which is uh, two years behind schedule. Uh, sorry, yeah, um, um, yeah, Crossrail. We've got uh, the NHS National Health Service uh, project, which has now been pretty much cancelled uh, after huge project overruns. Um, and uh, um, these are government projects. And and what I notice is that the people who are running them are the people who are actually writing the Prince Two Manual. Uh, I, I did some, quite a bit of research on this and then looked at um, also the same companies are being uh, hired, uh, the same same sort of large consultants are being hired to deliver these projects which are running late. So I figured this just something wrong here. And I think one of the big problems is that we have big projects. How do we mitigate risk? Uh, we work on small projects. Um, if you are, a lot of the reasons why these projects are overrun and why they're, they're late and uh, over budget and uh, deliver poor quality results is because uh, we don't have all the information up front. And uh, I don't believe we can have all the information up front. Uh, it's good to do planning. It's good to do contingency planning and risk mitigation. Uh, but in the end, um, if you're working in my world, which is software, so I don't work on infrastructure projects, I work in software uh, or, or technology. Um, and uh, these, uh, or integration of hardware and software systems, what's happening is technology is changing so fast that uh, we don't have, we cannot rest on our plans. Uh, you can plan and we should plan, but we just don't stick to the plan because the situation keeps changing. So what I would uh, advise is no big projects. Uh, in Scrum, the longest length, the longest duration of a project. So we'll talk about Scrum, uh, the origins of Scrum. But at the same time that I was studying PRINCE2, I was studying Scrum. And what we found that in Scrum, the largest length for a project is 30 calendar days. They're short projects, so we call them sprints. A sprint is a short burst. So with, uh, when you have no big projects, you're able to mitigate risk. Uh, the risk happens when there's uncertainty. So if you're walking in the dark, let's say you're walking home at night and the, the, the street is not lit up, uh, do you take big steps or do you take small steps? Right? Naturally, you take smaller steps. Why? Because it, it helps you mitigate risk. You might step in something and discover something later on that you didn't discover, which was you know, uh, 50 yards away. But as it starts to approach you and it, or you start to approach it and it's five, uh, you know, uh, five yards away, you can start to see uh, and, and, and change your direction to avoid the obstacle. So, um, with um, uh, now the question, I guess the big question is now, how do you take a large project and you bring it into a small project? Uh, we do that through technical excellence. Uh, before, it used to take us a lot longer to build things, but now we can build the same thing in less time. How? Because of our technical architecture, our, our, our modular design, technical architecture, and the tools. Uh, some people try to build things more quickly by throwing more people on the project. So I'll give you an example of that, um, <clears throat> of how technical excellence uh, reduces the time to market. And how are the large, how are the uh, most successful companies in the world? So I'm not talking about government organizations. Uh, government organizations have a terrible record of delivery. Um, and I think it really comes down to the fact that they have very large budgets and they're not competitive organizations generally. Um, you know, if they need more money, they just raise more. They have the, the wealth of the entire nation to raise taxes from. Um, and um, if you need to ha have a large infrastructure project and it's not delivered on time, well, who are you gonna go to, right? It's the government. There's no other government in, 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 in place. So there's no competition there. Um, but the companies that are trillion dollar companies now, Apple, Netflix, uh, Apple, um, Microsoft, um, uh, Google, and Amazon, these are now approaching, and some of them have surpassed the trillion dollar mark. Uh, they um, practice different approaches than uh, uh, the, 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 the typical, uh, you know, the Prince 2 that I, that I studied. Um, what they do is they embrace technical excellence. That's how they're able to reduce time to market. So I'll give you an example from the history. Um, Spain and the British Empire, the Spanish Empire and the British Empire during the 1500s and the 1600s and 1700s were in competition. Now, this, they were in the race with each other for uh, uh, taking over lands and uh, gaining wealth and resources. And the Spanish did it by enslaving populations. So they would go around the world um, and just uh, utilize pure manpower. 
and get them to extract as, as much gold as they can, uh, as much um, wealth as they could from any of the lands that they've uh, pillaged. Uh, the British were not innocent in this, but they had a different approach. Uh, what they did was they started something called the Industrial Revolution, which didn't rely on manpower. Mm. Uh, they built locomotives, they built uh, tracks uh, and uh, excavating machines, uh, and they were able to become more productive uh, uh, and extract more in less time. So large projects now became small projects through, through technical excellence okay, and innovation. Um, so that's one is uh, no big projects. Okay? Large projects have greater risk. And in order to mitigate the risk, we take smaller steps. And how can we take a large project and bring it into a small project? It's through technical excellence. How is it that Amazon, how is it that Microsoft is able to deploy to uh, hundreds of thousands of servers every 22, in, in 22 locations around the world, uh, um, 22 different data centers every three weeks? How, is it, how did they do that? It's through technical excellence, through modular design, through um, automated testing, automated deployment, and replacing manual labor with technical practices. How is it that Netflix is able to deploy hundreds of times a day to production? While you're viewing, while you're streaming, they're actually deploying to production hundreds of times a day. How is it that Amazon is able to uh, deploy thousands of times a day? We're talking about approximately 11.7 seconds to production environments. Right? It's coming through technical excellence and uh, good design, modular design. And it's going to come down to your technical expertise uh, of the people that you have. Uh, so there's a whole movement around that, uh, which, we talk, which we talk about, which we call agile software development. Um, okay, the next thing is um, your plan is wrong. Okay, so I'll explain, and then we'll talk about why we should also embrace failure. So these are three things we're going to talk about. One is uh, to mitigate risk. Uh, the risk happens because of uncertainty and unknowns. So how do you do that? You move closer to the risk and then you steer around it um, because uh, uh, we have to experience a little bit of it before, to, before avoiding it. Um, your plan is wrong, so I'll explain another story. Um, Scrum is for situations where we're dealing with uncertainty, complexity, lack of knowledge. And some people will tackle lack of knowledge. They'll tackle this problem of not having knowledge um, by doing more analysis and more planning. Okay. Um, uh, now, um, there's another story I'll share with you. Um, the way we used to fight battles, uh, at least in Europe, in the 16, 17, 1800s, was through command and control structures, where someone was in charge, and they're pretty much doing what a Prince II uh, project manager would do today. Um, the Prince II will plan, delegate, monitor, and control. So um, uh, we used to fight, fight terrible wars in Europe, very bloody wars, a lot of people dead. Um, but the, the, the managers, the generals, were always safely far back from the battlefield uh, as uh, people sacrificed uh, themselves, uh, being, basically being told to walk into, into fire. Uh, this continued until World War I, where World War I, uh, there was a stalemate on the trenches between France and Germany. And the British were planning a huge offensive to simply overpower the enemy with just sheer numbers of people, manpower. And uh, they uh, planned this battle for six months. It was in a region of France called the Somme. And the Somme, uh, there was <clears throat> the, the French trench line and the German trench line, and they recruited volunteers. Uh, and people signed up in droves. And they were positioned there and they were planned and they, and they were told what to do and any problems, any, any uh, this, this plan is going to work. Why? Because we have the numbers. And we'll bombard the, the, the German posts with uh, artillery for three days. Okay, so we'll knock out all of the machine gun posts. And if you hear any talk of retreat or any change in the plan, it's coming from the enemy. It's not coming from us because we're so sure our plan will work. <clears throat> so uh, they bomb, bombard the Germans for three days. And it was supposed to knock out the German uh, gun, uh, machine gun posts. It didn't. They sent the first wave in. And they didn't know that. They had no feedback. So they sent the first wave in. 
And uh, they were told to walk, not run, because they were so sure of the plan. And the entire first wave got cut down. Tens of thousands, uh, hundreds of uh, uh, thousands of soldiers across the first wave. So General Haig at the back, who later, later named to be known as uh, Haig the Butcher, uh, he was standing at the far, uh, on a, safely on a, a watchtower uh, about five miles away from the battlefield and said, ooh, that didn't work. Those machine guns should have been knocked out three day, you know, uh, over three days of, uh, after artillery. Uh, they weren't knocked down. Well, let's try the second wave. So we send the second wave of people, uh, thousands of people, to their death. Okay, well, that didn't go so well. We we're supposed to over overpower them. They weren't. So before they sent in the third wave, someone who was in the battlefield, in the trenches, saw what was happening. And when you're that far back, you know, five miles away, you can't see who's running, who's walking. You can't know what's going on. But somebody who did know what's going on, who was experiencing it directly, went back to Haig and said, "This plan is not working." We have to flank here, we have to flank there, we have a better chance. Uh, and General Haig said, don't you think it's, we've been planning this offensive for six months. We thought of every scenario. Don't you think it's too early to change the plan? Send in the third wave. So they send in the third wave. Now, if you go to the Somme today, you will see graveyards from every part of the British Empire. You will see uh, the, the um, uh, uh, Scottish graveyard, the Welsh graveyard, the Irish graveyard, the New Zealand graveyard, uh, part of the British Empire, uh, the Indian graveyard, right, from the, from the Indian part of the British Empire, the Canadian graveyard, uh, the um, South African graveyard, they're all there. Uh, those are all the people who lost their lives on a single day. It was the largest loss of British life in a single day. 20,000 people, 20,000 soldiers dead in one day. Now, this battle was orchestrated by the world's subject matter experts, foremost subject matter experts, in how to conduct warfare. So these, this is the best of the best, the military geniuses who have a lot of experience in battles. And yet, uh, it led to complete disaster. So the issue is not how clever we are or how much experience we have. We're applying the wrong tools. We're dealing with uncertainty. And uncertainty comes from two areas when it comes to our projects. It comes from uh, when we do not understand the desired outcome. And two, when the technology that we're dealing with uh, has causes and effects which we have not experienced yet. Now, this is growing more and more, this area of complexity. Why? Because of the rate of change of technology. Technology is changing at such a fast pace that by the time you master any technology, you're having to learn the next technology. And your previous experience does not help you anymore. Um, and uh, the desired outcome, the value of what we're doing. Often we don't understand the value of the things that we do. We, can, we estimate and we plan and we project, but we don't actually know the value until we see real users and real customers interact with it. And that's how we know for sure how valuable it is. So when you're dealing with sort of this sort of complexity, what you have to do is you need to take uh, an empirical approach, okay? So the problem with, with our projects today is that we're dealing with uncertainty, where the desired out, uh, uh, outcome is not 100% clear. Hmm? The customer thinks they know what they want, but when they see it, they say, that's not what we wanted. Or maybe we understood what they want and they understood what they want. But when they got it out, they realized, hmm, actually it wasn't such a good idea. We thought we knew what we wanted, and, um, but maybe it's not such a good idea anymore. Because maybe there's a new competitor or there's a new disruption in the market, which is leading to different ways of doing business. Uh, we're dealing with times which are unprecedented, with market changes are changing all the time. Nobody thought uh, uh, that we would be in this situation now, uh, including the subject matter experts. And also the technology causes and effects. If we change something here, what's the effect over there, right? So to deal with that lack of knowledge, we take uh, an iterative approach where we, um, uh, what uh, Salah had talked about was a closed loop, closed loop system. This in front of you is not a closed loop system. This is an open loop system, okay? It needs to be managed, but if you can somehow put in a feedback mechanism, so how many of you have studied electrical engineering, uh, mechanical engineering, or um, 
chemical engineering. If you want to put it, maybe put it in the chat window and let me know how many people have studied electrical, mechanical, or chemical engineering. This diagram might make sense to you. So you go ahead and put it in the chat windows just so I know who I'm talking to. Yeah, okay, yes, absolutely. Aerospace, right? Uh, yes, uh, some really good points here. Those companies that are rich, they've, they learn to fail a lot. That's correct, well done, okay. Uh, that's what I believe, mechanical, electrical. So you've seen this, the closed loop systems. Anybody heard of a PID controller, right? So this is an example of a system which takes care of itself. It doesn't need to be managed. It corrects for itself. So when situations are different, it can correct itself. Why? Because it has a goal. It has a desired outcome. We have a desired outcome and we're able to measure the uh, output, right? Yeah. Like an air conditioner, yes. So this is one feedback loop, but this is only one feedback loop. A lot can happen in a project. The maximum length for a project in Scrum is 30 calendar days, but a lot can happen in 30 calendar days, okay? So uh, you have another feedback loop, which is smaller. It's part of this uh, larger feedback loop, and you have a, another goal, which is part of this larger goal, and you have another feedback loop, which is part of another feedback loop. So now you have a tighter closed loop system, which gives you inf more information about stuff that's happening on a daily basis, where you can inspect and adapt more frequently. If you're using uh, this iterative approach with software, often you'll have another feedback loop, which is your continuous integration build process, which gives you feedback about the state and the soundness of your software through tests and uh, in continuous integration. So these systems, you have smaller feedback loops, which are subsumed by larger feedback loops. And those larger feedback loops are subsumed by even larger feedback loops. This architecture is known as subsumption architecture. Okay. And this uh, is based, someone pointed out, this is like a, a, an air, air conditioning system. Yeah. If it gets, uh, now in the UK, we rely mostly on heating systems. So this analogy is from heating systems, but you set a temperature and the blasts out uh, warm uh, um, heat, heat. And then when it reaches the temperature, it switches itself off. Why? Because it's, it, it, it has a goal, uh, which is this and it has a feedback loop. And those are the two things you need for self-managing and self-organizing teams. The guy who created Scrum was inspired by this, but he saw this on a massive scale. He rented a lab from an MIT professor who was doing research on artificial intelligence. And this architecture is known as subsumption architecture, where one feedback loop is uh, subsumed. Subsume means something exists within something else. And another example of subsumption architecture is uh, an onion, a bustle. Yeah? One skin is inside another skin, which is inside another skin. But we're not talking about onions here. We're not talking about dolls. We're talking about feedback loops. And on a grand scale, it looks like this. Now you have systems which are intelligent and autonomous. And what they're able to do is to navigate in environments with obstacles and react to changes uh, in their environment. So let me just play this uh, video here. I will share uh, the screen here. So as you can see, the team can navigate in environments with obstacles. In environments with obstacles. Yeah. Now, they're not bumping into each other, you see? They're all um, uh, coordinating amongst themselves. Uh, if you had centralized control, where there was, they just stuck with a plan and followed a plan, uh, then uh, this would not be sustainable because there are changes in the air currents, uh, there are changes in uh, you know, small changes which have a huge impact. It's a, it's a matter of them uh, colliding with each other or escaping each other. Now, at what point do you allow people to self-organize? You know, what, what's, how, how, many, how many of them can you include before you need to start to introduce uh, some managers? Well, here's another example of subsumption happening in nature. So the idea was that it was inspired in artificial intelligence originated in nature, 
where these animals, sometimes you see them as ants and uh, bees, they communicate amongst each other, to each other. They don't go through any centralized command and control. They don't sit around waiting. They don't sit around waiting for someone to tell them what to do. So there's no leader here. They're all moving in the same direction at the same time. And the information to change direction goes through the system very quickly. And this is happening on a massive, massive, massive scale. So this would beg the question, uh, these and the robots that you saw are um, uh, uh, examples of subsumption architecture where nobody needs to tell them what to do. They're intelligent and they are autonomous. And the guy who created Scrum, he said, well, this is interesting. They're, they're intelligent and autonomous. Nobody needs to tell them what to do. Nobody needs to plan, delegate, and monitor and track their movements. Um, they're intelligent and autonomous. And he said, I wonder if humans could also be intelligent and autonomous. Maybe. Let's try it out. So that's where Scrum came from. One of the, one of the, re one of the reasons why Scrum came about was a realization that maybe we're dealing with people with free will, people who can think, intelligent, not just resources, right? Not just resources. Uh, resources can't think, but people can. So um, that will allow you to deal with situations that are constantly changing because the feedback loop is much tighter. If you have to go through some centralized control, centralized command, then it'll take a lot longer that information uh, to, to go through the system. And um, so in Scrum, the most important people are the people doing the work, not the people who are managing it. And they are self-organizing. And what allows them to be self-organizing is two things. One, you have to have goals, okay? Every feedback loop must have a desired outcome. And then you have to have feedback loops. And then they can be self-organizing. And the more feedback loops, the more goals you have subsumed by other goals, the more autonomy you give them, uh, the better job they can do. Um, and when the manager's uh, a manager role is very different uh, in Scrum and Agile software development, what they do is they actually build the projects around the people who are doing the work. So they don't give them a project to implement, they ask them to create the project. Okay, so you can see that here. I'll share uh, this screen here. Uh, this is a famous document, uh, which many of you have heard of. What we do is we build the projects around the people who are doing the work. So we don't give them a project to execute, but we give them a problem to solve and they create the project. And we give them the environment support they need and then we just trust them to get the job done. Okay. So uh, uh, if we don't do that, if we override the decisions uh, from the, uh, uh, that are made by the people who are actually doing the work, if we override their decisions, uh, then we end up with things like the Battle of the Somme, um, Chernobyl, uh, Space Shuttle Challenger, uh, Space Shuttle Columbia, uh, the Deepwater Horizon project, which uh, Salah had talked about, when the engineers knew there was something wrong. Now, I used to work at BP here in Canary Wharf in, in London, and every, uh, um, every three months, uh, my pass, my card would expire and I couldn't enter the building unless I completed some training. And the training was specifically on whistleblowing, how to blow the whistle, <laughs> how to tell on your manager, basically. Um, uh, during the Deepwater Horizon, uh, uh, prior to that, there was a, a whole culture of uh, appeasing your manager and covering up. If you knew there was something wrong, um, you didn't necessarily say it because it wasn't your responsibility, it was somebody else's responsibility. But the culture now around BP is all around taking responsibility. If you see something wrong, report it. And so um, the managers are no longer um, uh, have any sort of immunity from, 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 from scrutiny. Uh, so um, uh, other engineering disasters where the engineers are told to just follow the plan. We've thought of everything up with the, where the managers say, we thought of everything up front, stick to the plan. Um, the example is uh, the Boeing 737 MAX story. Okay, same thing. The first time the company was run by a non-engineer. And that's okay. You can have companies run by non-engineers, even if you're an engineering company. But you have to be willing to listen to the people who are doing the work. They know what they're doing. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, uh, of course, the coronavirus situation. We're in this mess because the subject matter experts are not being listened to. We have profit and politics, which is basically silencing. You've heard what happened in China where the, the earlier on, 
the doctor who identified the seriousness of this, seriousness of this, of this problem, uh, was silenced and told to write a written uh, apology to, to recant what he said. And, um, and then he eventually died of, sadly, divide, died of the, of the virus himself. So um, your plan is wrong, okay? Um, and in, when you're dealing with uncertainty, uh, then you're gonna have to entrust the people who are closest to the action to uh, self-organize and avoid those um, uh, impediments. And the, of course, the criteria for that is goals and feedback loops. If you don't have a goal, people cannot self-organize around anything. So they need to be able to self-organize around a goal. Okay, so there's nothing wrong with planning. Of course, plan, but just don't stick with the plan. Okay, so we're now on to um, embrace failure and redundancy. Okay, failure is such a bad word today, but um, it's actually in fashion. Uh, so a lot of people are embracing failure. And the reason is because if you are not failing, you're not learning. The companies like Amazon, like Google, as someone pointed out in the chat window, um, these companies are so profitable because of their rate of failure. Because of the rate of failure. In other words, the rate of learning. Failing and learning are exactly the same thing. There is no difference. Okay? Some of you have young children. Some of you might have young children who are under four or five months old. And they're not learning to walk, okay? They're not learning to walk. If they're, if they're four weeks old, they're not learning to walk. Some of you have children who are 14 years old and they're not learning to walk. How do you know? Because they're not falling down. Same with the one who's four weeks old. They're not, they're not uh, falling down. But some, somewhere at the age of one, maybe 12, 13 months or 11 months, they get up and they fall down and they get up and they fall down and they get up and fall down. What do you call that? We don't call it failing we call it learning but at the point when they fall down that's when we recognize that failing is happening so embracing failing is brace embracing learning but the way we do things in scrum is we fail early when it's safe to fail so we will always fail but the question is how can you master failing in a safe manner so it doesn't you can control the uh, negative effects of that failure and increase the rate of failure and so you are increasing the rate of learning and a child will never learn to walk if they sit there and plan how to walk. Uh, you will never learn to swim if you go through all the textbooks and try to study all the strokes and do all the analysis and planning and contingency planning. Eventually, you're gonna have to get into the water. The question is, do you get into the deep end or you get into the shallow end? You get into the shallow end because it's safe to fail over there. Right? Get a little, get a little bit of water, swallow, swallow a little bit of water and um, no one's gonna die. So the question is, how can you fail well, okay? The second thing is redundancy. We'll talk about that now. Um, most of these ideas from Scrum come from uh, Japanese uh, product development that was in the 1980s. Now, America was terrified of Japan in the 1980s. Why? Because the Japanese were producing amazing products. They were highly innovative, high quality products, which, um, uh, and now the Japanese were dominating in automotive, home electronics, heavy equipment. This is the first time this happened. Before that, America dominated in all those aspects. So the Americans were studying very carefully what the Japanese companies were doing. What were, what were the Japanese companies doing? They were failing well. They were trying things out in situations where they had no information. They had no experience in. They were trying things out, but they did it in such a rapid way that they grew knowledge where there was none before. So these are two, Japan, these are two American professors who spoke Japanese who were studying these are two MIT professors who, who wrote this paper for Harvard. And uh, they wrote a book called The Knowledge Creating Company, which I have right here, The Knowledge Creating Company. And a lot of these ideas uh, came from these um, uh, uh, companies. They were, they were Honda, uh, Fuji Xerox, Fujitsu, Canon, um, NEC. So these were companies that were studied. And what they noticed was that North American companies, what they did was they followed a sequential approach where they delayed failing until the end. We call that waterfall. Testing happens at the end, and that's when, test, that's when failure is discovered. It's because discovered during a testing phase, okay? So um, what they noticed was that the, um, uh, the Japanese companies, what they were doing is they, were, they embraced failure, that a 1% success rate is supported by mistakes made 99% of the time. They had to fail, why? Because they were doing stuff that no one had done before. 
They were driven to a state of zero information where prior knowledge does not apply. What do we call that? We call that innovation. Innovation is doing stuff that you've never done before. And how do you maintain your competitive edge? You do things that nobody's ever been done, nobody's ever done before. So you cannot rely on your experience, okay? If you're relying on your experience, you're probably staying in your comfort zone. If you're staying in your comfort zone, you're probably not learning anything new. You're not taking risks and um, you're not innovating. And so you're leaving that to your competitors and they will overtake you, okay? Um, now, how do you mitigate the risk? Um, you create redundancy, okay? So these are two things which seems to go completely against what we would do in North American approaches. First of all, in North American approaches, we're afraid of failure, right? We're afraid of rep reputation. We're afraid of um, looking dumb. And uh, the second thing is redundancy. In North American companies, they get rid of redundancy. If they have two people who have the same skills, they get rid of one. Why? Because it reduces their operating costs. And if it reduces your operating costs, you get to increase your margins and you get a bigger bonus as a manager. But how long does that last for? All you're doing is you're creating more risk. You're creating more single points of failure. And so what we do is we create redundancy. I tell my people to be well-versed in two technological fields and in two functional areas. Now, two technological fields, you get it. It's okay, we're engineers, right? So most of these quotes came up from a project at Honda. And uh, these engineers were developing a new product. And they were given an incredible amount of autonomy uh, to do this and freedom to do this. Um, however, it was conditional. They had to be well-versed in two technological fields. You remember my Prince2 project manager who said, you are only a back-end developer? And I said, but I can do front-end code. I can do requirements analysis and testing. Says, no, you are only going to do one area now. Well, that goes against what, the, what, the, what they're saying here. Here, you tell your people to be well-versed in two technological fields. Okay, I get that. Fine, you're an engineer. Two technological fields. And, but then it says two functional areas like design. Me, the engineer, designer? I, I've never done design work. I don't, haven't got a creative bone in my body. Well, congratulations, you're now new the, you're the designer. But I don't know how to design. Yeah, well, better start now. Um, and marketing, oh, come on. Don't we have any people with MBAs who take care of the marketing? No, you are now the marketeer. Why would you do that? Sounds absolutely ridiculous. Embracing failure and creating redundancy. So first, why would this make sense? You have to look at what uh, context Scrum is for. Scrum is for this context here where you're dealing with uncertainty so there are people who are going to have to perform in areas that have never performed before you're dealing with uncertainty complex means you are uncertain of the technology causes and effects and you're uncertain of the requirements the value of the work that you're doing okay so even the designer why don't you trust this to a designer someone who's got 10 years experience in ux design because nobody has 10 years experience in UX design for what we're doing. Someone says, I've got 10 years of experience in uh, websites. Look at all the websites I've done. Look at the interaction. Uh, I'm an excellent website designer. You want to hire me? And then the company says, Ooh, we're not doing websites. We're doing smartwatches. How many years of experience can you possibly have in smartwatch, smartwatch design? Not many. Okay. So uh, even the subject matter expertise, expert is learning on the job. They're doing things they've never done before. Okay, so, um, and so uh, they were uh, also given the go-ahead from top management, provided they would develop the product by themselves and also take responsibility for manufacturing, selling, so it's not the responsibility of a sales department, but the engineers themselves are looking at the sales experience and servicing it, okay? So they're thinking, they're shifting their focus from my task and, and to the entire product life cycle. And they had now a shared division of labor where each team member feels responsible for and is able to work on any aspect of the project. I know it sounds crazy. Usually we have, we, we have a bunch of subject matter expertise. Subject matter expertise are great. Huh? Um, having, hiring subject matter experts was pretty good up until around 1996 when we had the internet because now everyone is a subject matter expert. Yeah? Who's a subject matter expert for anything nowadays? If you want, you can Google it. Who's the subject matter expert? Is Google. Google is the subject matter expert. The subject matter expert is someone who's seen two more YouTube videos on the subject matter than you have. 
we all have access to the same knowledge, which is why I will get it. When I go to Riyadh, when I, when I go to Riyadh, I've got these taxi companies. These are drivers who know the roads quite well. But I don't get into those cars. I get into a car where the driver might not even know the roads. Maybe they come straight from another country and they're either driving around and I can trust them to take me home. Why? Because they have access to the same technology, Google Maps, right? So this is, we're still running our companies as if we don't have the internet. Anyone can look up anything. If the knowledge exists, it's already online. But these companies that I'm talking about, the Ubers, the Microsofts, the Amazons, the Googles, the Netflix, they are doing things that you cannot Google online because nobody's done it before. That's how you maintain your competitive edge. So the, the team starts from zero information where each team, team member soon begins to share knowledge about the marketplace. So you need to have this feedback loop where marketeers are now becoming technical and technical people are now becoming marketeers. So this whole division of labor breaks down where you pass the work from the business analyst who understands the market and then passes to the architect who only understands the design architecture and then passes it to the developers. Instead, all activities are happening at the same time. And we call this sashimi. Sashimi was, a, was a, one of the quotes in this um, paper. Now, sashimi is a Japanese food where uh, it's raw fish. I know it looks pretty gross. Um, but what makes it sashimi is uh, how it's laid out on the plate. It's all overlapping. What they said was that North American companies were following a sequential, traditional, or relay race approach. Okay, so if I was to point out here, the sequential, traditional, or relay race approach, where one product team, well, one, uh, the product development went through a number of phases, kind of like, like this. Uh, waterfall approach. But in the Japanese companies, they weren't doing that. They were overlapping. So they called this sashimi, and some were lap overlapping even more. And some, you couldn't figure out where one phase started and one phase ended. All activities were happening simultaneously. Not like a relay race, where you pass the stick to the next department or the next runner, but more like where the, the ball is constantly going forward and backwards, like in the game of rugby. Okay, So in rugby, you have this, um, all activities are happening at the same time. Now, this picture you're seeing here, this is not what I'm talking about. Don't be fooled by this. This is simply waterfall, but it's drawn in a circle. This is what we're talking about, where all activities are overlapping, like sashimi. Okay. Now, this approach here uh, was you're probably familiar with the term waterfall. It was coined by um, a person whose name is Dr. Winston Royce. And he said, don't do it. Okay? He said, it doesn't work. And how do I know that? Uh, I'll share the paper with you. So here is uh, the paper. And what he said, he was studying particularly large projects. So this is back to my point, no large projects. What he said that with large projects, what people try to do is follow a sequential approach. Where you do analysis and then you design and coding. That's, that's okay. For what? For small computer programs, for internal operations. But he said the problem is when people try to do this on more complex endeavors, where they try to do this on a large scale. And he called this dysfunction, he called this mistake, he called this anti-pattern, he called it waterfall. This phase approach does not work when you're dealing with complex things. When you are dealing with a large computer program for delivery to a customer, what do customers do? They customize, right? They don't know what they want until they see it. Especially when you're dealing with new products and new services in new markets, we're introducing things that people have never seen before and they don't even know whether they're going to like it. How many times have you, just, have you bought something and you realize after I didn't need it? Or how many times did you uh, discover something on your phone which you didn't think you need? I mean, how many people felt the need to send pictures of their food to all their friends three times a day? Well, I'm having, look at the pasta I've just, I've just ate. I'm, I'm, I'm about to eat. Nobody thought there was a need for that. But when you have the technology in your hand, it starts to change your behaviors. So you're dealing with a complexity. You don't know how your technology is going to be used. Um, so, uh, when you're dealing with, with that, you've got to take a more empirical approach where you have to experience things, where you have to go forwards and backwards. And so he said the problem with waterfall is it simply doesn't work. So he didn't, he didn't invent waterfall. 
He simply described it. He described why the projects were, uh, so many projects were failing. And he says it right here. The, implement, the implementation uh, described above is risky and invites failure. And then he goes on to explain why. He said that the testing phase occurs at the end of the development cycle. cycle. It's the end, it's too late. Now you're discovering quality at the end when you spent all that money and you spent all that time and all that effort and now you're testing to see whether it's okay. That's the first time where you can test for things like timing, storage, input, output, and, uh, input and output transfers. That's the first time in the project when things are experienced as distinguished from analyzed, which means that everything prior to this testing phase is just analysis and planning and design. You haven't validated any of your assumptions until here and it's too risky to fail at the end. So that's why he says, really what you need to do is go forwards and backwards, forwards and backwards, not just one step backwards before going forwards one step, but also sometimes two steps backwards, okay? So what happens to your phases? All of your phases fall apart. And now you end up with an overlapping approach. And um, if you're uh, unfamiliar with the game of rugby, there are no phases, all activities, are happening, happening uh, simultaneously. Okay, so if everything's happening simultaneously, then um, you're able to, um, uh, you, you, are, you do have a plan in the beginning, but you're also not relying on the plan because the situation is changing uh, constantly, okay? All activities are happening simultaneously at the same time. Um, okay. Uh, which is actually very much the nature of software development. Software development, we generally don't work in phases. We're told we have to work in phases because the project managers tell, to, tell us to. But as a software developer, I have firsthand experience at this. And I know that when I am writing my code, I am analyzing the requirements at the same time. I'm still going into the requirements. I'm still trying to understand what the customer is saying as I'm writing my code. And I'm also designing. So I'm doing this activities. I'm designing my solution as I'm writing it. Okay, now there's also high level design and low level design, but design still continues as you're coding. And you're also testing your work. As you are coding, you are testing your work simultaneously and you're integrating with others. So these phases are a bit artificial for us. Maybe they work for infrastructure projects, but when it comes to software development, according to Dr. Winston Royce, the guy who coined the term waterfall, he said, don't do it. Okay, do you want, I just wanted to show you the car that the Honda team created. And this was developed by a bunch of junior engineers who had no work experience at all. They were all uh, graduates. They were graduates and they were trusted to build a new product uh, without having any previous work experience. They had starting from a state of zero information and the managers allowed them to do that. What they did was they build the projects around the individuals, gave them the environment support they need and trusted them to get the, dog, the job done. So basically what they did was this is what we've been talking about. Okay, and the car that they created was um, so the car that they created was uh, this one here. This is the Honda City. Okay, and it's a very popular car today around the world. In North America, it's called the Honda uh, um, uh, Fit, and in the UK, it's called the Honda Jazz. Uh, it originally was always a hatchback and now you can get in a sedan format, same with the Civic. Um, but the interesting thing is that Honda already had a Civic team, but the Civic team was not allowed to touch this car. This car was, complete, was developed completely from junior engineers, uh, the Honda City. So the, they already had success with the Honda Civic. But when it came to um, this new project, the Honda Civic team could not touch this project. It was given to a bunch of junior engineers. So in the end of the day, we are all junior engineers when you're dealing with uncertainty, when we're dealing with things that no, nobody has ever done before, when we don't understand the technology causes and effects, and we don't understand the value of what we're doing unless we see it. So that's one of the reasons why it's so hard to follow a predictable project schedule, because we don't know how long it's gonna take. We don't know how long it's gonna take because we don't understand the, the technology causes and effects. People ask us, well, it took you 55 minutes exactly to find that last bug. So we have, uh, how long is it gonna take you to cover, find 10 bugs, which is multiplied by 10? No, it's not gonna work like that because every bug is different. 
Now, people who are trying to understand why can't you get this level of predictability? It's because we're not working in a factory. We're a applying factory patterns, fa factory pr um, uh, practices uh, from the 18th century to uh, our um, creative projects. And so creative projects, we don't understand the technology causes and effects. We change something in the code and it could have an effect somewhere else. It, you cannot time it's how long it takes to write five lines of code and then say it will take us 15 uh, minutes to write um, uh, three lines, uh, you know, um, uh, X number of lines of code. Things are not that predictable because coding is not simply typing. And it's like painting. Painting is simply not just throwing paint on the canvas. It's a design activity. And that's what we're doing as we're coders. We're solving problems as we're coding. We're coming up with solutions. Furthermore, so the one of the reasons, the most accurate way of knowing how long it takes to do something is by doing it. Okay, so I can estimate how long it's going to take, but an estimate is not reality. An estimate is a model. At this point, I don't have any data on how long it takes. I have to do it, then I have some real data. The other thing is how, how, how valuable is the work? We are prioritizing our work based on value, but let's, let's, let's face it, we don't actually know the value of our work, okay? You might think it's valuable. How do you know the value of your house? Well, you could put it on the market. That's not the real value. You might get an analyst, a subject matter expert with lots of experience to tell you the value of your house. That's not the real value. You might look at other houses on the street. That's not the real value. That's just analysis. And the only way of knowing the real value of your house, you might even get an offer, but that's not the real value because it could be withdrawn. The real value is when you have the data, once it is sold. So when you're dealing with uncertainty when it comes to value, technology, cause and effects, there is an approach. It's called empiricism or empirical process control. What we do in Scrum to tackle this unpredictability and uncertainty is we have to run experiments. We grow knowledge where there was none before. Knowledge is, empiricism is this idea that knowledge is, just, is derived not from logical planning and reasoning and drawing examples from the past uh, or looking at other situations and drawing analogies and chaos and these sorts of things, but rather knowledge is derived from direct experience. Though, you have to experience it. You have to, you have to see what, and so, this is known as evidence-based management, and Scrum is nothing more than evidence-based management. The way we mitigate risk is by doing things, getting real data, and then running another experiment, and changing something, and then running another experiment, and then changing something, and then running another experiment. And over time, you start to understand the technology cause and effects, and each time, you start to understand the value of what you're doing through experimentation. What we do in Scrum is simply the scientific method. If you understand the scientific method, then you understand Scrum. It's exactly the same thing. You start off every sprint with a sprint goal. In Prince 2, they used to call it a project mandate. Now they call it a business case. Why? Because it hasn't been proven yet. It's a business case. You have to prove the case. When you go to a court of law, you start off by presenting a case, and then you have to go and prove it. Well, in Scrum, it's called a sprint goal. You have to prove it. It's called, in science, we call it a hypothesis. And then you carry out the experiment, and in the end, you observe the data, you reflect on the data, you start to drive um, cause and, and, and effect relationships, and then you run the next sprint and you change something. It's what scientists are doing right now with the COVID-19, with the vaccine. They're running clinical trials. So this is why scientists love Scrum. They understand it. They say, we don't know anything. Our job of scientists is to uncover new knowledge. Even the subject matter experts are confused that they don't know what to do. Some are saying, try this drug. Some are saying, try that drug. Some are saying, um, wear masks. Some are saying, don't wear masks. Some are saying, two feet away. Some people say, don't even go outside. Some are saying, everybody's saying something different. Why? These are not idiots. These are subject matter experts. They're the world's disease experts. It's the fact that they're dealing with something which is uncertain. It's new. The coronavirus is called the novel coronavirus, which novel means it's new. And so how clever you are and how powerful you are in terms of budgets and these sorts of things are not going to help you. According to Charles Darwin, who is a um, scientist, uh, who said that it is not the strongest of the species that is going to survive, nor the most intelligent. Many of us work for large companies. Large companies have the most risk exposed right now to these changes entire oil companies. Nobody predicted that oil would go negative value. 
okay? These are strong, large companies. And according to Darwin, it's not the strongest of the species, nor the most intelligent. These are subject matter experts. They hire the best MBAs around. It's not those people that are gonna survive. It's the one that's most adaptable to change. And we call that agility. The movement that, that we are talking about, the agile software development movement, the original name was adaptive software development movement. And so as we approach a period of increasing uncertainty, which is not gonna slow down, it is not the one who has the most experience, the one who has the most background, the one who is the cleverest. History is full of companies which have experienced and clever people, but those are companies that are unable to change to changing circumstances around them quickly enough. Okay, and how do we do that? Back to take small steps, no big projects. Plan, but don't follow the plan. The plan is wrong. It's not based on any information. Right now it's just analysis. And embrace failure and redundancy. Increase your rate of learning. Don't be afraid of failure. And the one who doesn't fail is the one who doesn't learn. And create redundancy, which means have more than one people with this, growing the same skill sets. Then what happens is you can have people challenging each other's ideas and you get better products that way. And furthermore, um, if there is too much of one type of work or too little of another type of work, people can move like they do in the game of rugby towards the ball rather than waiting for the ball to come to them. If you have people who say, well, that's not my job, I don't do testing. That's not my job, I don't do um, requirements analysis. So what we do in Scrum is really, what we're doing is we're challenging 200 years of management thinking. Management thinking which was well suited to the industrial revolution, but not our economy today, what they call the knowledge economy, or what Google calls the smart creative economy, right? where it's all about innovation and tackling uncertainty. Okay. All right, so that's that. I would like to open up to uh, questions now, and we do have uh, quite a bit of time for questions. Uh, I'm sorry, it was a long time for, for you to, uh, to sit through that, but um, um, I'm hoping that you've been eager to ask uh, lots of questions. So go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Abed. Uh, it was really interesting, uh, the, so valuable information. Uh, please, for the all participants, if you have any question, you can write it down. Or if anyone wants to participate, participate uh, by talking, uh, we can uh, give you the chance. Just write in the chat box. Here, Mr. Abed, we have a question from uh, Mr. Anas. Uh, by the way, how are you, Anas? Uh, he's asking about what is technical excellency. Okay. So yes, Anas and others, so many other people I recognize you on this call, so many friendly faces, so many well, faces, yeah. so many friendly yeah. names. Yeah. yeah. Right. So alhamdulillah, we have a very good thriving uh, community in, in Riyadh. Uh, and uh, you know, this, what we're doing, I admit, like I meant said, we're, we're challenging 200 years of management practice. 200 years of management practice. So this requires your support and you to challenge it as well. Uh, you know, it is uh, not everybody's uh, convinced of these ideas. So um, uh, what do we mean by technical excellence? Well, a lot of it comes down to the design of your architecture. Some systems are not designed for iterative and incremental development. They're designed for big upfront design and big delivery. And those, of course, are, is not how you manage risk. If you have control over things on a smaller level, we call that modular design. Okay, so people have come up with um, rather than these large megalithic systems, what they're doing is they're creating smaller and smaller systems. They start off by doing tiered approaches. So you change one thing in a tier and it doesn't affect something else. And you create these levels of abstraction and isolation so that um, uh, you can mitigate the risk. If you change something or something fails, it doesn't cause uh, something else to fail as well. Um, redundancy as well. Right? If you have something fail, then something else kicks in. That's another way of achieving uh, technical excellence. And so your good design will help you achieve technical excellence and also your people. Okay. This movement was founded by software developers, not process junkies. Okay. In fact, they were directly going against the, the heavyweight processes of the 1980s. 
In the 1980s, there was a person who was going around saying, the quality of your product is going to be determined by the quality of your processes. And so that's where things like CMMI came from, where you have 25 um, pr process areas and five different maturity levels. And that the idea is that you can put anybody into the, into, the, into the system. As long as the process is good, it doesn't matter what your technical skills are. But what we come to realize is that that's okay for manufacturing. In manufacturing, you have low-skilled workers where they don't have to exercise creativity and problem solving. You just do all the problem solving and create, to create the production line, and you can get any low-skilled worker to just go and repeat the same process over and over and over and over again. Okay? But our work is different. It's going to rely on the technical skills of your people. What Google calls, don't trust in your plan, trust in your technical insights. Google, uh, I have the book here, um, How Google Works. And in there, it says very clearly that all of our uh, products that you and I use, the Google products that, that you and I use, like everything from search to Hangouts to Gmail, was conceived by our engineers. And all of our product flops, like Google Glass and Google Plus and a whole bunch of them uh, were conceived, those ones that have failed were conceived by our marketing executives. Okay. So um, it's a great book, How Google Works, but I experience this directly. When the people doing the, who are doing the work are coming up with the project ideas and getting other people to execute their agenda, from my experience, it doesn't lead to very good results. But if a, a good leader, what they'll do is they'll create consensus on a goal, a shared goal, a vision, not my vision, but a shared vision. They present the problem. They say, what are we going to do? And they trust the engineers to come up with a solution. Those, those are the products that are winning products. When you tap into the collective intelligence of your uh, workforce. So uh, technical excellence can come down to tech, your technical practices, continuous attention to technical excellence, right? Not at the end. You know, some people do the testing at the end. That's the silliest thing in the world. Yeah. I used to work for a company called SQS. We used to call us at the end to check to see whether the thing performs. And they would run some tests. And we would run some tests to see if it performs. Does it scale up? But we do that at the end. And we tell them, it doesn't, doesn't scale, doesn't perform. Well, why didn't you call us in the beginning? Why are you calling us to do performance testing in the end? Okay. We can help you design something in the beginning and run with a series of tests in the beginning to, so we don't get into a situation where we're designing a system that, a system that doesn't perform. So we do things like test-driven development and uh, where the test begins and then you do the work or continuous integration, not integration at the end of all the parts, but continuous uh, integration. So one of the ways that people combine that technical excellence with Scrum is not through Scrum, but through XP, extreme programming. Because Scrum doesn't have any software engineering practices. In fact, it doesn't have any engineering practices. It's simply a framework in which you have to attach your own engineering practices on too. And if you're dealing with a software, typically nowadays it's object-oriented software, there's solutions that are gonna come from other practices um, uh, from uh, extreme programming. And I'm very glad to actually have taught the very first uh, certified Scrum developer course in, uh, in Saudi Arabia from an absolutely stellar company with uh, incredible uh, technical ex excellence. And um, Anas Daoud knows who I'm talking about. Um, but also um, I've had people come from Saudi Arabia to the UK to attend my certified Scrum developer course because people are starting to realize that's where the real power is. Not from standing five kilometers away with binoculars and trying to orchestrate the battle from over there, but it's from the people who are in the trenches who are doing the work and experiencing things on a daily basis and uh, experiencing uh, technology causes and effects firsthand. Uh, okay. Um, where do the words, uh, it's a long, long question. Let me just go back to this to make sure I, I'm backing up here. Uh, transitioning from a non-Scrum to a Scrum organization. Okay, so um, uh, Ahmed Ibrahim, how do you transition from canceling all the roles and combining into one role only? Okay, so that's a bit more of an advanced question because I didn't really talk about the Scrum roles uh, yet. Um, but that's, um, I think what we're saying here is that companies have roles, that's fine. And there's hierarchies, there's leads, there's divisions of labor, that's fine. And you, people need to do that in order to, for hiring purposes, for career ladders, for remuneration process, for communication channels, that's fine. But when it comes to product delivery, and Scrum is not concerned about the project, it's not a concern about your company, it's concerned about the product, okay? And when it comes to product delivery, what Scrum asks you to do is leave your egos at the door. Often we wear our egos on our, on our, on our sleeve. Eh, I'm a developer, I'm an architect, I don't do any testing. 
I'm now a manager. I don't do any, any, any uh, uh, testing or requirements analysis. We see it's something below us. And so our ego is preventing us from doing that. So have all those, those things in your company where people do have, you know, um, hierarchies and things like that, especially if you work in a large company, that's going to happen. When you work for a startup, it's not going to happen. If you're four people, no one's going to say, I'm a senior architect. I don't do testing. Senior, senior architect, senior what, buddy? There's only four of us, right? We've got a lot of testing work to do. We can't just afford, to, we can't afford to have you sit around waiting for something to design. We've got some testing to do. So we're trying to get large organizations to big startups. And it requires you to leave your ego at the door. And the second thing is it requires the organization to give the people the freedom to move to where the ball is rather than waiting for the work to come to them, but to go to where the work is, okay? Um, can a fresh junior take on this rule, uh, even if it doesn't have a strong technical background? Absolutely. Look, uh, a few days ago, I didn't know Python, okay? And I learned Python, huh? because we have access to the internet. There are videos, there are endless classes in, you know, online classes. And so, yes, you can. Um, uh, you can acquire new technical skills. And some, easier, some are easier to acquire and some are not easier to acquire. Some are going to take six months. Some are going to take six years. And you have to assess, is it worth me investing the time or is it not worth me investing the time? But often, you know, a few clicks away and we have the answer online. So yes, everyone can learn things. Look, my COO at SQS, I wish I could show you his... Uh, okay, what I'll do is I'll show you this now. Okay, let me, let me show you this here. Um, he doesn't know I'm doing this. Let me just quickly show you something here. Um, okay. So this is my uh, former boss from, um, I was a director at a company called SQS, we're a software uh, quality assurance company. And if I show you him, I would like you to show, tell me which is the before and which is the after picture. Here we go. Okay. So I, I'll share the screen now. And okay. So this is my former COO, uh, Phil Tomlin. Which is the before and which is the after? Which one represented career progression? Did he move from the picture on the right and become uh, a CEO on the left? Or did he move from COO to developer? CEO on the left and turn to developer on the right. You can clearly see the one on the right looks like a developer, right? Okay, so here's an executive who is now a developer. So he hasn't coded uh, before, uh, and now he's a coder. He's, he's an executive. A lot of people think, oh, I'm, I'm, uh, that's, that's beneath me. I've done my development, now I'm a manager. But in the end of the day, it's not the strongest or the cleverest of us that's gonna survive, it's the one that's most adaptable to change. I know a lot of managers who are, out of, uh, who are out of employment. I don't know a single software developer who is unemployed. The world is moving to software. Everything is software now. Um, so if he can do it, uh, you know, we've had people who've never coded before and six months later they're coding at our most um, techly demanding technically demanding clients, doing Docker and Kubernetes and things that I've never done before, but, but they're doing it, why? Well, we all have access to the internet, right? So um, back to the uh, question, uh, the group chat, okay. Um, okay, so, uh, so don't think it's a demotion. Um, to go from, and, and I also do a lot of work with Microsoft. And Scott Guthrie, he is the general manager for, uh, he was the, for 10 years, he was the general manager for .NET, which is a huge program. Microsoft was betting the company on .NET in 2001, and they, they did very well with .NET. And um, he's a developer, and now he's in charge of Azure. He invented parts of the .NET framework. He, he created the MVC framework, he was on a flight, from across the US to another uh, Microsoft office, and he didn't like the ASP.NET framework, so he created MVC, and it became part of the framework. So these are people who don't stop innovating. Honda is a company of engineers, run by engineers, from the, from, from the top management right down, and engineers are always trying to come up with better ways of doing things, okay? So, 
okay, going on to the next set of questions here. Let me just uh, move this to the screen where it's easier for me to read. Oops. Okay. So we've got uh, uh, well, the word scrum actually came from rugby, which is why I'm wearing a Japanese rugby shirt right now. I don't know if you've uh, noticed. I looked very hard for a, a Saudi uh, rugby jersey. I have an Egyptian rugby jersey, but I don't have a Saudi rugby jersey. But it comes from the game of rugby where uh, a formation happens in the beginning of every single play. And that formation um, uh, looks uh, like this, really. I can share it with you. Um, so, yeah. So this is what it looks like in rugby. It's a formation that happens in, happens in the beginning of a play. And let me just share the uh, uh, thing with you. Okay, so this is the formation that happens where you try to get possession of the ball. Okay, now it looks like there are a bunch of individuals pushing a, pushing uh, uh, their opponents over a ball. But we can't think of them as individuals. We have to think of them as a single unit, a tightly integrated single unit. And so that's what a scrum is. And it's a single unit, a, a team, a group of people who are a single unit. And every day they see how far they are from the sprint goal and they uh, choose and adapt their tactic. And in rugby, that, that formation where you choose and adapt your tactic for the next play is called a scrum. Okay, uh, I'm a scrum master and I have a good success story, but I think I need to know more about the subject matter in that field. So, um, uh, uh, they've actually um, uh, started to make scrum courses more mainstream now. Um, in, in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So get in touch with Empower. They are, I do all, you know, the, 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 all the public courses that I do are, are, are through Empower and uh, they've got an excellent office, but then of course, when they have larger classes, they, they go to other venues as well. So uh, get in touch with them. Uh, there's nothing more exciting for me than to bring these ideas to the Middle East and to the Muslim world. So, um, uh, you know, um, looking for, uh, you know, uh, opportunity, opportunities. Um, the question is here, what is the difference between Agile and Scrum? So Scrum is a framework for product development. It's not specifically for software. It's for complex product development. It was first used in NEC, Canon, for creating things like can, uh, cameras, uh, photocopiers, the PC-01, the Canon AE-1, and the Honda Jazz cars. So these are products which are not specifically software, bread makers, uh, things that people have not been done before. Um, and, um, but it became popular within software development. And it was uh, being discussed at a conference called OOPSLA, Object-Oriented Programming Languages Association. Uh, and uh, there was a number of other movements happening at the same time, extreme programming. And so these people came together and they expressed a certain um, set of principles, 12 principles of how they develop software. And Scrum was represented in that meeting. And they call that de declaration, they call it the Manifesto for Agile Software Development. Okay? And that document is about software development. Scrum is not specifically about software development, it's about complex product development. Okay? Uh, waterfall is, you can also use for product development, but you'd only use it for predictable situations. Okay? Scrum is for unpredictable situations where markets are changing, you're dealing with new technologies. And so with software, you're dealing with unpredictable situations because technology is changing so fast. And you're designing with cars, you're, 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 you're producing many cars with one specification. But with software, you're not producing the same feature again and again and again like you would in, a, in an assembly plant. You're producing different features for different customers. So when you're dealing with customers, but they have that, that level of customization. And when you're dealing with technologies, that's where Scrum comes in, in from. And so Scrum is a very good candidate for software, but Scrum itself doesn't have any software engineering practices. For that, 
you'd probably look towards the most, the second most popular uh, agile software development method, which is XP. And uh, um, so um, uh, speak to Empower if you want to have an XP course. It's, it's um, where you get hands-on experience with the uh, uh, test-driven design. And it's actually quite difficult for someone who's coded before. For people who've never coded before, uh, it's okay. People do quite, they're actually okay. But the people who've had 10 years of experience or more, you have to unlearn all your previous practice. Remember what we said, starting off from a state of zero information where prior knowledge does not apply. So this is particularly hard for, for experienced developers. Uh, but for new, new people, it's actually easier to learn how to do TDD and continuous integration. Um, how does an innovation company, Google, manage it? Uh, I, would, I would look to the best. So look to the trillion dollar companies, the Googles, the Microsofts, the, um, the uh, Apples, look to the best. Don't look to, don't look to these guys, okay? The Prince2 people. And they're trying to copy what other people are doing, but they misunderstand. Now you can get Prince2 in regular flavor, or you can get it in Agile. Now they come with Agile too. So you can get regular flavor, or you can get Agile flavor. Everyone is now, you know, even PMI. You can buy regular flavor, or you can buy Agile flavor, right? So um, these are a lot of people who come late to the market uh, because they're, they're really interested in selling certifications. It's a funny thing, the, the demand for, for, for prints too in the UK is dropping dramatically, especially during a recession. People, when the ship is sinking, they tend to throw people over the edge who they don't need. And generally we need the people who can keep the, the ship afloat. However, the certification market is growing. Right? Because a lot of people are losing their jobs, and so they have time to take certifications, and they're, they, they're very competitive with other people who are also losing their jobs. So they have to need that certification. So um, stick to the Googles, stick to the Amazon, stick to the Apples. Find out what they're doing. A lot of these ideas we talk about, we're inspired by them. We take their ideas, we bring it into uh, the course. And uh, these are trillion-dollar companies. Government organizations, the, most, uh, the, the biggest failing products, projects in the world, are usually military and government projects, infrastructure projects. And I think, by the way, is the Saudi metro station, metro system, is it, is it up and running yet? I think, no, sorry, didn't want to rub that in. Um, but uh, yeah, stick to the most competitive organizations in the world, uh, find out what they do, um, you know, and, uh, and, and see how they manage themselves. Um, in years of program delivery, I learned to adopt one mandatory rule across every project work stream. Uh -huh, right. Uh, that allowed injection of changes by understanding work stream output in line and changing external factors. Okay, so um, the interesting thing is we have some government success stories here in the UK. We have a group called GDS, Government Digital Services. They're the part of the government that nobody ever heard of before. Okay, everyone's heard of revenue uh, department, everyone's heard of you know, foreign affairs, internal affairs. Um, uh, uh, the Treasury. Um, these are, I would say, very glamorous positions in the government, and if you work for these. But there was a group of people called Government Digital Services. What did they do? They put information out on the web. So if someone wanted to pay their bills or their taxes or something like that, they can go that. Now, nobody was paying attention to them. The managers were not interested. The politicians were not interested. So there were a bunch of developers who were left to do what they wanted, to, what they what they were you know, what they, what they thought was best. And so they created new ways of working. They adopted uh, these uh, XP and Scrum and, and Agile software development practices. And they got the attention of the politicians now because everybody was saying, wow, this seems to be the only part of government which seems to be working. And they're doing really well. They're delivering frequently. Uh, we have delighted customers and they're high quality products, right? So the government, now the reason why they were so success is because they were given autonomy, right? They were given freedom to develop things. There are a bunch of engineers, and engineers always want to make things better. Right? They're always trying to experiment and improve things. They're never satisfied. They were given the autonomy to do it. Now, what happened was the government took this idea and said, well, they did really well here. Let's take what they did, and let's make sure everybody else follows it. So they took GDS, Government Digital Services, gave it a name, call it Digital Government or something like that. Everyone's talking about digital something. And they made the Department of Works and Pensions, the DVLA, the Department of, uh, the, for, for uh, Driver and Vehicle Licensing, which I also work with, and all of them are being forced to use 
practices that work in a particular context with a different team. And that's the problem, is when, when we think that this success is formulaic, that there's somehow best practices out there. We don't believe in best practices because this world is so complex, there's so much uncertainty that when things are changing, by the time you get up with best practices and you publish them, they're out of date. The world has moved on, right? So, we're, so you have to constantly innovate and to change things. So uh, having some sort of prescription of the best way to do things, uh, in the Scrum world, we don't really believe in that. In fact, you know, the opening statement of the manifesto is we are uncovering better ways of developing software. We are uncovering. Uncovering means it's continuous. So if I was to show you here, you know, uh, we are uncovering. This is Mobari. This is not Maldi, right? It's continuous, it's present tense, and it's better ways. It's Afdal, not Al Afdal. It's not the best way. So we are uncovering better ways continuously. How? By doing it. Empiricism, you don't know anything unless you've experienced it directly. Not by planning, not by contingency planning. Yes, planning is good. We should plan. But we also have to recognize when you're dealing with complexity, the plan is going to have to change. Okay? Um, I think that's all the questions, and we are just about out of time. Uh, oh, oh, hold on, lots of questions here. Um, uh, the word uh, Scrum is not an abbreviation, so we don't spell it with a capital letters. Some people have done that, I'm not sure why. Um, yes, Scrum does rely on inspection, adaptation, and transparency. Um, yes, Scrum is very difficult to apply because you're challenging 200 years of management thinking. It's incredibly simple. It's not like the Prince 2 manual, which has, I counted today, 43 artifacts and roles and, cer and ceremonies. Um, Scrum has got only 10 things you have to know. So it's incredibly simple, but it's hard to do. Why? Because you're challenging 200 years of management thinking and it requires a lot of discipline. And this is where coaching comes in. Huh? Um, uh, okay, so uh, yes, it's difficult to apply for sure. And um, I mean, I don't know if you can see this, but. What you're doing is you're challenging this. This is um, a statement from uh, the Industrial Revolution where we create a division of labor, where we organize people in divisions of labor and we um, assign them tasks and we delegate and we monitor and we track them and we whip them <laughs> to make sure they get, and um, that's okay for you know a different era perhaps, but not in our work. Um, um, so uh, that, is uh, from 200, 200 years old, that approach. Um, yeah, so a product owner, it doesn't matter whether they're internal or external. The product owner's job is to um, protect the product. From who? Lots of people. Everybody wants something for the product. The customer wants this, the user wants that, the sponsor wants this, the development team wants that, and the product, job of a product owner is to protect the product from the customer, from the user, from the development team, from the they're the they're the product owner. They're responsible for the maximum for maximizing the value of the product. Okay. Uh, does the sprint include requirements gathering? Yes. Um, maybe I'll just finish off uh, with this. You'll see all of these uh, statements here. Uh, business people and developers must work daily uh, throughout the project. What are we doing? Gathering and clarifying requirements every day. It doesn't happen in the beginning of the sprint. Well, it does. It happens in the beginning of the sprint, it happens in the middle of the sprint as well, and it happens at the end of the sprint. Okay? And we welcome changing requirements. Why? Because it gives us a competitive advantage. Even during a sprint, with the, the scope can change. Things can change. We welcome change. We just have to make sure that it's safe to make the change and we reduce the cost of the change. And that's going to, again, come down to your technical practices. How can you uh, reduce the cost of change? Uh, I don't give courses in Arabic. Um, I haven't had the need for that. Many, many people uh, have said we work with people in English anyways. Uh, a lot of this material, this information is available in Arabic. So for example, I know the guy who translated the, uh, um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the guide, the, uh, sorry, the manifesto into Arabic. So here it is, okay. Mine gets automatically translated into, into, into English because my settings are like that on the computer. Um, also the Scrum Guide. Uh, I'm actually working on the, the next version of the Scrum Guide right now. 
um, and uh, it will be translated into English. But the, pre the, the, the live version right now is in, in Arabic as well. Uh, and also what I try to do is I try to use the Arabic words. I studied Arabic in Jordan for uh, a year and um, I can speak Arabic. Um, the problem is, um, uh, you know, I speak Fusha and uh, everybody can understand me. Um, and then I go to places like Egypt and I have no idea what they're talking about. So this is a problem for me <laughs> is that um, communication, I will, I will often mix the Arabic and the English, but the primary language in English. Um, uh, so they will give you a recording of the webinar. Um, yeah, you can estimate cost and time up front. There's many different techniques. Uh, Khalid's question, you can estimate time and time out, but treat them as estimates. And remember, estimates are wrong. If estimates are correct every single time, then you should be very suspicious. If they say it's going to take eight hours and they get it done in exactly eight hours, and the last time they said four hours and it got done in four hours, these are not estimates. Okay? What are they? It could have taken less time, but they're actually buffering. So we'll never really know how long it actually takes. So yes, we do estimate, but we don't treat them as promises to deliver within a certain period of time. Okay? Um, can we see the cost and time up front in Scrum? Uh, yes, thank you, Mahmoud Fully, for the good word. <laughs> um, yes, everyone. So share your information with Empower. They will, uh, I believe they've got it uh, recording, or they will um, and also give you any other information you have. And inshallah, hopefully this will all be, this whole coronavirus thing will be over. Uh, but, you know, what they say, um, be optimistic and hopeful, but prepare for anything. And uh, that's what uh, Salah had talked a lot about, contingency planning and risk mitigation. Um, so we're not stopping still, though. Uh, we're doing these courses now uh, entirely online, and they're all uh, interactive. Um, so we have a number of tools that we're using online, electronic post-it notes and uh, games that we play in simulations, uh, which will get you outside of your comfort zone as if we would. So if I can't torment you over there in Riyadh, I can torment you from here and uh, get you outside of your comfort zone. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Abid. It was a really interesting journey with you. Uh, as usual, you always, each time you are in person, us. Uh, maybe we'll ask you about the giant scrum courses. Uh, yes, we do. We provide the scrum courses with Abid for the different tracks. Anyone interested, just uh, provide us with your um, contact and the, uh, our contact information at the chat box. And if anyone has any question, uh, we can, uh, for uh, Mr. Abed, we can share it with uh, him and answer you back. Is there anything else or any questions before we close our session? There was one question in the chat window, uh, Reem. Uh, someone was asking, do I do the advanced certified Scrum Master course? Yes, I will be, but not right now. Um, uh, so that will be ready in a, in a few weeks. But however, if you, you cannot do the advanced course unless you've done the foundation course first. The reason is because the Scrum Alliance is not interested in just piling certifications on. They're interested in experience. So unlike the Prince 2 where I can do the foundation in the morning and do the practitioner in the afternoon, in Scrum, the Scrum Alliance requires that you have to have at least one year of experience um, practicing in these ideas, evaluating the ideas, failing with these ideas, and then the coach or trainer will validate uh, your experience and say you can do the advanced course. Uh, okay, Khaled, uh, inshallah we will contact you. Please provide us with your uh, uh, email or uh, mobile and we'll contact you. Uh, anything else? Do you have anything to add, uh, Mr. Abed? No, thank you very much. Really appreciate you uh, keeping this going. And, you know, there, there, there's, uh, uh, you're playing a huge role, important role in spreading these, uh, uh, getting people to challenge and evaluate these ideas in, in, in the Middle East and Riyadh. So thank you for inviting me. And everyone, thank you for, for attending. With me. Thank you, Abed. And inshallah, see you soon after uh, uh, everything is settled down. See you soon again in Riyadh. Inshallah. inshallah. Thank you, everyone. Uh, see you inshallah tomorrow with uh, our uh, other sessions.
uh, in different topics. Uh, thanks. And goodbye.